Well, good morning. And welcome to First Baptist Fairdale. We're glad to have you here. We're excited to be gathered for worship. And as you're getting yourself situated, finding your seats, I want to encourage you to open in your Bible to Psalm 38. Psalm 38 is going to be our call to worship this morning. As you're turning there, I hope that you got yourself a bulletin. As you were coming in, our bulletin is our primary way of letting you know what all is happening. Uh, so we've got all of our announcements listed in there. And a few that I just want to highlight for you is starting September the 12th, uh, we're going to have a three-week new members class. And this is going to meet during the Sunday school hour. It's going to be downstairs in the basement, and it'll meet with Pastor Josh Green. So if you are new to our church, uh, this is a requirement for membership. But even if you're not even thinking about membership yet, uh, if you just want to know more about our church, if you're interested on in what it is that we believe and what, why do we do the things that we do, you can come to these three weeks of, of new members class and learn all about that. Uh, all right, we also have an Ecuador interest trip meeting coming up. This is going to be September the 19th, right after the morning service. So if you are interested in any way, shape, or form uh, about Ecuador going next summer, then there will be an interest meeting there. The last thing that I want to highlight is that uh, in September and October, we're going to do another book study on Wednesday night. We've done these before. We've done quite a few different ones. Uh, and so we are going to go through the book Gentle and Lowly. All right, so we have copies of that book here at the church. You don't have to buy your own, uh, and that is going to start. We're going to have a group for men and women, and that will start Wednesday, September the 15th. Uh, again, there's lots of other announcements here in your bulletin, so make sure you have that and make sure you're looking at that so you don't miss out. But let's look now at our call to worship, and let's let the Word of God prepare our hearts for worship. Psalm 38. O oh Lord, rebuke me not in your anger, nor discipline me in your wrath. For your arrows have sunk into me, and your hand has come down on me. There is no soundness in my flesh because of your indignation. There is no health in my bones because of my sin. For my iniquities have gone over my head. Like a heavy burden, they are too heavy for me. My wounds stink and fester because of my foolishness. I am utterly bowed down and prostrate. All the day I go about mourning. For my sides are filled with burning, and there is no soundness in my flesh. I am feeble and crushed. I groan because of the tumult of my heart. O oh Lord, all my longing is before you. My sighing is not hidden from you. My heart throbs, my strength fails me, and the light of my eyes, it also has gone from me. My friends and companions stand aloof from my plague, and my nearest kin stand far off. Those who seek my life lay their snares. Those who seek my hurt speak of ruin and meditate treachery all day long. But I am like a deaf man. I do not hear. Like a mute man who does not open his mouth, I have become like a man who does not hear and in whose mouth are no rebukes. But for you, O Lord, do I wait. It is you, O Lord my God, who will answer. For I said... Only let them not rejoice over me who boast against me when my foot slips. For I am ready to fall, and my pain is ever before me. I confess my iniquity. I am sorry for my sin, but my foes are vigorous. They are mighty, and many are those who hate me wrongfully. Those who render me evil for good accuse me because I follow after good. Do not forsake me, O Lord. O my God, be not far from me. Make haste to help me, O Lord, my salvation. God, as we are gathered here this morning, it's good for us to be reminded that we can cry out to you with all the cares and burdens of our heart. God, it's good for us to know that you are a protector, that you are a, a shield for us. You are a refuge for your people. And God, I pray that you would help us to understand that even though we are guilty, that we are sinners, that we have not kept your law, that with you there is forgiveness. God, with you there is steadfast love. And so God, we ask this morning that as we worship you, we would be reminded of the ways in which you have saved us. 
that we'd be having our eyes focused on Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. And that, God, as we worship you this morning, our, our singing and the preaching would all be done in a way to make much of Jesus. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Would you stand and sing with us? standing and greet one another. Do you return to your seats as we continue in song? I stand amazed in the presence 
of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me a sinner condemned unclean singing how marvelous how wonderful and my song shall ever be how marvelous how wonderful is my Savior's love for me and he took my sin Sorrows. He made them his very own. And he bore the burden to Calvary and suffered and died alone. Singing how marvelous, how wonderful. As the ocean, loving kindness as the flood. When the prince of life, our ransom, shed for us his precious blood. And who is love will not remember. Who can cease to sing his praise? He should never be forgotten Throughout heaven's eternal days On the mount of crucifixion Fountains open deep and wide Through the flood of God's mercy through the past and gracious times grace and love like mighty rivers poured in sand from above heaven's peace and perfect justice is the guilty world in love 
past the heavens, countless as the stars above are the souls that he has ransomed, precious daughters, treasured sons. We are called to feast forever on a love beyond our time. Glorious Father, Son, and Spirit, now with men are intertwined. Amen. Would you please be seated? Scripture reading this morning will be from John chapter 14, and I'll read verses 1 through 7. So it's John 14, verses 1 through 7. Don't let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If not, I would have told you. I'm going away to prepare a place for you. If I go away and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself, so that where I am, you may also be. You know the way to where I am going. Lord, Thomas said, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? And Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will also know my Father. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this day. Lord, we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you that as believers, Lord, we have full confidence that he has prepared a place for us. Lord, and as we place our, our faith and trust in what Christ did for us on the cross, Lord, our full confidence and, and faith is in him and in the hope that we have of an eternal home with you in heaven. God, we thank you for seeking us when we were far away, seeking us when we were sinners, Lord, seeking us when we did not know how lost we were. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for all that you do for us. We thank you for saving us. We pray, Lord, that you would continue to save. We pray that you would continue to work in the hearts of people here in this building today and around the world. We pray that you would save many, Lord. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.
amazing love I see. What an amazing love I see. Your grace has come to me. for our offering. Dear God, it is good to be gathered in the house of the Lord today to worship you, uh, to fellowship with one another, God, and, and to hear your word. God, we pray that you would, uh, you would bless us as we continue in worship through our offerings. God, we pray that you would help us to be good stewards of the money that you have blessed us with. Help us to love others well with it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for that. Well, church, as we come to a time in our service where we have a time of pastoral prayer, there's a great deal of, of things going on in our world. We have the ongoing pandemic. We have situation in Afghanistan. We have a large hurricane that at this point in time is making its way onto shores in Louisiana. And there's lots of other things that our nation is dealing with. And so this morning in, in our time of pastoral prayer, I want us to, to pray about trusting in God alone. So please join me in prayer. Lord God, we thank you, Lord, for this day. Lord, and even as I, I just mentioned, there, there are many things that are going on in the world around us. Many things that we are fearful of many things that, Lord, honestly, we have zero control over. Lord, and in those times, Lord, it is easy for us to be fearful. It is easy for us to, to seek someone to trust, seek someone to do something. Lord, as we, we want to pray now, Lord, that we would look to you, that we would trust you. Lord, that you would work mightily in each of these situations, that you would be with the United States citizens, and our soldiers, the Afghan people who have been working with us in Afghanistan, Lord, we pray that you would watch over them. We pray that they would be able to be evacuated safely, Lord. We pray, Lord, for your 
comfort and protection for them. We pray for your comfort for their families. And Lord God, as we have a hurricane that is coming into our southern shores of the United States, Lord, we pray that you would provide protection for those people who are sheltering, those people who are evacuating. We pray that you would be with emergency responders, Lord, who are trying to help people who are stuck. Lord, as, as we fear these things, as we fear at times the, the, the pandemic, the COVID virus, Lord, we pray that you would be our refuge. We pray that we would trust in you alone. We pray, God, that we would rest in you alone. We pray that we would know, Lord, that our salvation ultimately comes from you. God, I pray that you would be our rock, the thing that we can hold on to, our anchor in the storm. Pray, God, that you would be our stronghold because we know that you will never be shaken. Help us, Lord, to know that our only hope resides in you and you alone. Regardless of what happens in this world, what happens in, in our lives personally, Lord, we know that you are in control, that you can save, that you are our rock, you are our salvation. And we pray, Lord, that you would continue to watch over us and protect us and lead us and guide us. We pray, Lord, that you would be our refuge and our strength. We pray that you would help us, Lord, to trust you more and more in times such as these. Help us, Lord, to, to come to you in prayer and pour out our hearts and talk to you about the things that we have need of, the things that are concerning us. We pray, Lord, that you would work mightily in the world today. We pray that we would hear your voice, that we would see your hand. We pray that you would be honored and glorified for all that you will do. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thanks, Matt. If you would, turn the Bible to 1 Thessalonians. It's the first time in a long time that we have gone to the letter to the church in Thessalonica. But I'm excited this morning to start us off in a new book study, new book series, the letter that Paul wrote to the church in Thessalonica, or called First Thessalonians. If you're new to church, then this is going to be different for you because there are different ways for churches and pastors to do preaching. And there's topical, and then there's uh, walking through books of the Bible, and that's what we like to do here. What we're going to do today is we're going to start this First Thessalonians, and we're going to stay in it as long as it takes. We're going to make sure we cover every verse by the time we get finished with this, you guys are going to be experts on this one little letter. Now, it's a big Bible, right? There are 66 books in the Bible, and 1 Thessalonians is one of the smallest ones. But you're going to know it really, really well. It is our conviction here as pastors that it's our responsibility to put the Word of God before you, to help you grow in the Word of God, to know it and understand it. And so... It's not so much that we have to hit a home run or have a peak performance or, or even be all that inspiring. I hope I am inspiring, but you know what I mean. But rather to bring you to the word of God and to show you what God says. And that's what we do. We just recently, we finished up the book of Job and we had a great time walking through that long book. Before that, we did the book of James and we really enjoyed studying the book of James. But today... We will start 1 Thessalonians. Now, Thessalonians is a book in the New Testament that we have two of. We have 1 and 2 Thessalonians, and we are going to cover both of those. They are very similar. They seem to have been very close to each other, and so we're going to keep it going. When we finish 1 Thessalonians, we will just move right into 2 Thessalonians, all right? And I think you're going to like that. 
There's a lot of context for us to get, though, so that we can make sure we understand it. You know, the Bible is God's word to us. It is his revealed word. It is the truth. The Bible says that it was inspired out of the mouth of God. These are the very words of God delivered to us, written by men, but inspired, wholly inspired by God. And so we receive this as perfect, no flaws, absolutely 100% true, and now we want to read what God is saying to us. Truly, it is as if not we're looking outside up at the clouds and hoping to figure out through discernment what God is leading us to know or believe. At times, we do that in life as we are curious about decision-making or anything else. That is not what this is. That's not what Sunday morning worship is. That's not what Bible reading and Bible study is. This is the perfect, holy word of God. And every bit of it, God has given to us from Genesis to Revelation to be our way of knowing who God is, what God is like, and how he wants us to understand ourselves and God and this world that we live in. So it is good and right and healthy and fitting for us to come and submit ourselves to it And adjust our seat and make sure, hey, I'm going to spend the next several weeks or months studying this. I would encourage you, if you want to, to get on Amazon or something like that and find you a book on Thessalonians. Maybe a commentary on Thessalonians and read that along with us. If you have some free time at home where you can read, that would be excellent for you. If you don't, then we understand Sunday morning will be good enough. If you need a recommendation on some book or commentary on Thessalonians to help you with it, we pastors can give you that too. It's going to be good. Now, I said context is important because there are a lot of instances where people try to use the Word of God for their purposes, right? Just a few weeks ago, I heard of this uh, lady in Texas that quoted the book of Peter about the election in Texas saying that God's election is sure of his people, right? Which is totally taking the Bible out of context. And just this week, right, we heard our president quote Isaiah 6 about uh, the U.S. Army going to Afghanistan, which is totally wrong and out of context, right? It looks foolish. It's not true. It's inaccurate to quote the Bible for our wrong and selfish purposes, especially when it's not accurate. Okay, that's really, really bad. It makes us look like we don't know what we're talking about. It makes us look like we don't know what God said or why he meant that. So we are here today and every other Sunday to study this and get it right. The Thessalonians are Christian people that live in Thessalonica. That's a city in Macedonia, all right? They are people. I know it's a big word, and you're thinking, I don't even know how to pronounce Thessalonians or Thessalonica. I know that. But it's still people. Like we say we have Kentuckians or Louisvillians or Fairdalians or North Carolinians, right? Or Americans or Ecuadorians, right? They are people from a place. And that's what Thessalonians are. They are just people from a place called Thessalonica. But they're the Christians. And we know, we know a lot about these Christians because we know how it started. And I'm going to show you that context today. But to get us going, I want us to read the very beginning so that you can see this. Chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy. To the church of the Thessalonians and God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. That's his intro. That's his greeting. Paul is the one writing this letter to them. He's got his buddies, his companions, his travel partners with him, uh, Silvanus and Timothy. Now, by all accounts, we're pretty sure that this Silvanus is Silas. Throughout the book of Acts, throughout the travels, throughout the missionary journeys, he just goes by Silas. Here he says Silvanus, but we're pretty sure it's Silas because these guys are always together. So Paul and Silas and Timothy are writing this letter, or they're with Paul when he writes the letter, and it's to the Thessalonians. Everybody sees that. That's what verse 1 is about. But it's not to just the town, it's not to the city, it's to the church there. It's to those who have believed, and that's important for us to understand, okay? 
We have a common ground and a common bond with other believers. Those who believe God, those who trust God, those who believe his word, those who are believing in Jesus Christ for salvation of their sins, those who are following Jesus, living in repentance, eyes on him, letting him lead us and guide us. There is a connection between believers. And Paul is writing this letter to the church, to the Christians in Thessalonica, not just to the town, okay? There would be two different messages if we wrote a message or a note or a letter to the city of Louisville or if we wrote a letter to the churches in the city of Louisville. And so it's important for you to understand he wrote this to the church in Thessalonica. But there's even more than we know about that. All right, and We won't do this a whole lot, but today we must. Turn with me to Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16. The book of Acts serves us so well in the New Testament. God is the author of the Bible, and it is so well put together. The first four books of the New Testament are the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But then we get this book that's Acts, which is very much so a history book. It serves as a survey or a guide for what the rest of the New Testament is about. Everything that we understand from Romans to Revelation, and Romans being the book after Acts, and Revelation being the final book of the New Testament, everything that we understand from Romans to Revelation makes more sense when we understand the book of Acts. And so you can see how really, really, really disconnected we can become with the Bible if we're trying to read those books without knowing Acts. So at Acts chapter 16, I want to show you a couple things. Follow along with me. All right? Verse 6, 16, 6. And they went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. And when they had come to Mysia, they attempted to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. So passing by Mysia, they went down to Troas. Now look at this. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing there urging him and saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. And when Paul had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go on into Macedonia concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. All right, let's stop right there. Paul and Silas are missionaries traveling the world. They'd already been sent out by their church, and they are going and they are traveling, and they are preaching gospel from town to town. Here, Paul receives the Macedonian call, a place in the world that they had not been. That this vision tells him to come to Macedonia. We need the message here. And so they decide to go. If you want to look at a map, you can look this up. If your Bible has maps, you can look this up too. There are cities in Macedonia. Philippi, which is the letter to the Philippians. Berea, which is what we read about in Acts chapter 17. The Bereans. Thessalonica, which is what we're reading about here with the Thessalonians. These towns are located in Macedonia. And if you look at a map, you'll see them there. And so it looks, it makes perfect sense that they, they traveled and they went from here and then they went to here and they went to here. And each of these little towns being about 30 miles apart or something like that. And so it makes sense as we're reading through the book of Acts. So there they get the call and they go to Philippi. Well, Acts chapter 16 is that great story of them being beaten and putting in prison, and yet at midnight they are singing and worshiping God, even in prison, and God rescues them out of there. The jailer is so upset about them being set free that he's ready to kill himself, and Paul calms him down and says, don't kill yourself, buddy. God did this, and God can save you too. And that Philippian jailer believes in Christ, and his whole family does too. It's an awesome story. That's Acts chapter 6, and that's the first thing that we learn about in Macedonia. But then we get to chapter 17 of Acts. Look at chapter 17 of Acts. Acts 17. Now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica. Does everybody see that? 
If you see Thessalonica in 17.1, shake your head at me. You see that? Okay. This should be eye-opening for you. What we're going to study for the next several weeks in Thessalonians is a letter written back to the people he's encountering right now. So let's read it. Verse 1 of chapter 17. Now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul went in, as was his custom, and on three Sabbath days he reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and rise from the dead, and saying, This Jesus, whom I proclaim to you, is the Christ. Does everybody see that? Paul went to Thessalonica, he preached boldly Jesus. He preached boldly the Christ, the Savior. He preached boldly the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. There is the crucifixion there. There is the resurrection there. There is the Savior there. There is the salvation message there. This Jesus is the Savior. You need to know him. He is preaching this in Thessalonica. They had just traveled there. They end up in this city, and he is preaching. Now, it says there for three Sabbath days. Sabbath is Saturday. That's the day they would have been at the temple. And so for three Sabbath days, it says he did this. So that's at least two weeks that they stayed there. We don't know how long they stayed there, but that's at least two weeks. And here's why. Saturday... To Saturday is one week, to the third Saturday makes two weeks. It doesn't necessarily mean it's three weeks. We don't know if he arrived on a Sunday or a Monday or a Wednesday or whatever. But I'm just trying to get you to see that they were there at least for a little while, at least for three Sabbaths, three Saturdays, so that he could be in the synagogue and he could be reasoning with them, as it says, explaining and proving from the Old Testament word of God that Jesus is the Savior. Now look at verse 4. And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a great many of the devout Greeks and not a few of the leading women. So there you have it. In verse 4 of chapter 17, we know that in Thessalonica there are now believers, many of the Jews. Many of the Gentiles and many women had believed that message. The Bible says that when we go and preach the gospel message in the power of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will draw people to God and God will save people. He'll do that anywhere in the world at any time that he pleases. When the gospel is preached, the power of God draws people to God. And that's what we see happened in Thessalonica. It doesn't tell us how many, but it does say many of the Jews, many of the Gentiles, and many women. All right? Everybody sees that. So because of this right here, there are now Christians in Thessalonica, Thessalonians, Thessalonian believers. And that's where the letter comes from. But let's keep reading. Verse 5. But the Jews were jealous. And taking some wicked men of the rabble, they formed a mob and set the city in an uproar and attacked the house of Jason. So let's stop there for a second. This is the first name that we find of a Thessalonian. Do you guys know any Thessalonian believers? You do. At least one right now. Jason, right? We have his name there. We don't know anything else about him. He's never mentioned beforehand. Seems to be pretty awesome, as you'll see here in just a second. He takes a beating on behalf of them. Wasn't even his fault, but he took the beating for them. But you're about to see the message coming out of Jason's house. But there's the first Thessalonian that we know of, Jason. Verse 6. And when they could not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brothers before the city authorities, shouting, These men who have turned the world upside down have come here also. And Jason has received them. Praise the Lord, right? In the midst of all of the opposition to the gospel message, Jason said, yeah, y'all come on into my house. I'll take care of you. I'll show some hospitality. I got space for you. I'll cook you dinner. I'll make sure you're taken care of. I believe in this Jesus too. Okay, verse seven. And Jason has received them. And they are all acting against the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, Jesus. There is one true king, who's the king over everything, 
and the king over all kings, and that every single one of you must bow down to, and every single one of them must bow down to, and his name is Jesus. But that Jesus loves you and wants to forgive you of your sins, and he gave his life for your life. Jason knew that, Paul and Silas know that, and many Thessalonians now believe that. Verse 8, and the people and the city authorities were disturbed when they heard these things. And when they had taken money as security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. Now look at verse 9. The brothers immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. They're gone. They left Thessalonica. And in a nutshell, that's about it that we know about Thessalonica and the Thessalonians from the book of Acts. But then we get the letters to the Thessalonians and all of a sudden those nine verses are opened up big time by the letters he's going to write to them. You wonder, well, what happened when Paul left? When Paul and Silas left Thessalonica, I wonder what happened. Did they fall away? Did the church dissolve? Did they even have leaders? Did they believe the word? Did did, uh, the worldly religions creep in? Is there syncretism there? I mean, what was going on? We don't know until we get to the letters. But I told you that there was one named Jason, and I want to show you something else. Turn over to chapter 20. Turn over to chapter 20. Acts 20, starting in verse 1. After the uproar ceased, Paul sent for the disciples, and after encouraging them, he said, Farewell and departed for Macedonia. So he's trying to go back. He's trying to go back to Macedonia, okay? Now, if you know anything about the book of Acts, he had traveled and escaped Macedonia and gone down to Athens, but now he's trying to go back. Verse 2, when he had gone through those regions and had given them much encouragement, he came to Greece. There he spent three months. And when a plot was made against him by the Jews as he was about to set sail for Syria, he decided to return through Macedonia. Sopater, the Berean, remember we just heard about Berea, son of Pyrrhus, accompanied him. Now look at this next line. And of the Thessalonians, Aristarchus and Secundus. And then he names a few more people and he talks more about his travels. But there are two more names. Now Acts 17.4 says there were many Jews, Many Gentiles and many women that got saved under that preaching. And so there's the start of the Christians, the church in Thessalonica. But Acts 17 mentions Jason. And Acts 20 mentions Aristarchus and Secundus. And so you and I know of at least three people that the New Testament tells us are real believers that Paul was spending time with, discipling them in the church of the Thessalonians. It's a little bit of context, isn't it? So now let's go back to 1 Thessalonians. In the first letter, we have five chapters, and in the second letter, we have three chapters. Neither is very long. Both are pretty encouraging. Some letters are more heavy than others. These are encouraging. And it seems that there is an emphasis in these letters on the return of Christ. And today I want to spend time teaching on this theme, the return of Jesus. Because the letters to the Thessalonians mention the return of Christ so often, they have been called the eschatological epistles, which means the letters referring to the end times. Eschatology is the study of the last days, end times, end of the world, the return of Christ. So some people have called these that. But since Paul is writing a letter to churches about those subjects and others, some people say they should just be called church letters because he's instructing the church. But he does mention many, many times the return of Christ. Now, Thessalonica, during this day, had become really the capital of Macedonia. And everything that I'm reading says that during this time, there were about 200,000 people in Thessalonica. Quite a bit bigger than Fairdale. We have about 8,000 people from the Walmart to 
Coral Ridge. Thessalonica, though, was a place that they had made it to, and they preached Jesus, his death on the cross, the salvation he offers, and people had believed. So we don't miss that. But because of the opposition, they left. And we see that they kept traveling, and now what we have are these letters. And the emphasis today is just an overview. Next week we will start at verse 2 and we'll start walking through all of it. But there's an emphasis here on the return of Christ. And I think, and I loved what Pastor Matt prayed about, that in the midst of an ever-changing and very much so unsettled world that we live in, we need to trust God. But the beauty of trusting in God is the truth that we have from God that settles our soul, that anchors our faith in what we believe. And it's not so much things like he loves us, he cares, he sees, which those things are very comforting. But there are real tangible truths too, like he made us, he came here, he lived on this earth. Lives like the lives we live. He was tempted in every way. He cried. He hurt. He had people treat him wrongly. Life wasn't fair for Jesus. And every time you're reminded of how unfair life is, you should take courage knowing that it was unfair for him too. And then he died for us. The righteous for the unrighteous, the godly for the ungodly, the good for the bad, if you can hear that. And they buried him, and three days later, God raised him from the dead. Death could not stop God and his Savior, Son, Jesus. The grave couldn't. A crucifixion couldn't, evil couldn't, evil people couldn't, the devil couldn't, sin couldn't. Nothing can stop God. And the Bible will take that so far to say nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. If you are in Christ by faith, nothing can take that away from you. If you are in God's hands, his strong, mighty hands. The Bible says nothing can snatch you out of his hands. After Jesus toured the earth a little bit for 40 days, after God raised him back to life, he showed himself to many believers. And after that, he ascended up into heaven where the Bible says Christ is now, seated at the right hand of God in heaven, overseeing all that we're doing. Even right now, he sits beside God the Father, praying and advocating on our behalf to make sure that we are safe and secure in his salvation, empowering us through his Holy Spirit to live lives of faithful obedience to him. And every time we fail and sin and fall short, he is there reminding the Father and reminding us that we are loved and we are safe in him. It's an awesome story, and it's a beautiful, beautiful, truthful message to be a believer of our Savior the Lord Jesus Christ. Upon ascending to heaven, though, the Bible tells us he is coming back. He will come again. And this may be a point of belief for Christians that we just don't remember enough. We don't remind ourselves enough. Because it's taken so long, already 2,000 years, you might be thinking, is it even true? Will it even happen? Will it happen in my lifetime? But the New Testament, the Bible tells us this is to be one of the strongest points of belief that we have. And that every day we are thinking and hoping and watching for the resurrection. The Bi I mean, the, the, the return of Christ. The Bible says that when Jesus returns, he will come like a thief in the night. And the reason why the Bible says that is because those who do not think sin is wrong and bad will not take serious a return of the king to save his people and to judge the world 
And so they won't expect it. And so they'll be caught off guard like a thief in the night. If you've ever had somebody come and break in your car at 2, 3, 4 in the morning, you feel bad about that and you wish that it had not happened. And you think, well, if I'd have known they were coming, I'd have waited up for them. But you didn't know what night they were coming or at what time, and so you missed it, and they got you, right? Well, the Bible says he's coming like a thief in the night. But the Bible says time and time again that the reason why he tells us that the return of Christ will be like a thief in the night, it's for all the people who do not believe that he's coming. It's for all the people who do not believe that he came the first time, that died on the cross for their sins, and that they need to be rescued and saved and taken to heaven. And so for those who do believe, the Bible says the return of Christ is one of our greatest truths. It's our hope. It's what we want more than anything. For Jesus to come back and set it all straight and save us and take us to heaven. Where in heaven there will be nothing bad. No crying, no pain, no COVID, no war, no nothing bad. That day is coming. And we are to remind ourselves it sure is coming. And we can't wait for it. We are ready. And so since we know that the return of Christ is coming like a thief in the night, we are to stay ready. Not necessarily awake all night looking up to heaven because the Bible tells us to rest as well, but living by faith in the return of Jesus, knowing any day now, Jesus, come. And this return of Christ, the second coming, and the reason why it's called the second coming is because when he came as baby Jesus through Mary, the Christmas story, that's the first coming. The second coming, which is what we call it, the return of Christ, is so often what first and second Thessalonians are about. Many questions get answered in these letters. This is going to be a great study for us. I hope you'll be committed. When you miss, I hope you'll watch from home. We're working really hard with our audio and tech volunteers to make sure that that's available to you all. I hope you'll say, I don't want to miss a bit of it. I want to believe in the return of Christ. I want to be anchored in the return of Christ. I want to be waiting for the return of Christ. I want to grow in this word so I'm sure of the return of Christ, the return of Christ for me, a sinner. So with that said, I want to give you three quick points this morning on the second coming of Christ. Number one, the continual reminder of the return of Christ. We are to always remind ourselves this. We are to think about it daily. We are to hope for it regularly. We are to expect it each and every minute. The continual reminder of the return of Christ. We read from John 14 today, earlier in the service. And that's where Jesus says, I'm going to heaven to get it ready for you. And I'll come back. The end of the Bible, the book of Revelation, almost the very, very last sentence says, surely I am coming soon. The whole Bible is about the return of Christ. We need a continual reminder of it. But I want to show you how this is an emphasis in Thessalonians. Follow with me. Chapter 1, verse 10. If you want to highlight these, you can. Chapter 1, verse 10. And to wait for his son from heaven. Okay, there's a mention. Turn over to chapter 2, verse 19. For what is our hope or joy or crown of boasting before our Lord Jesus at his coming? Turn over to chapter 3, verse 13. So that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. The Bible just keeps mentioning it. Look at chapter 4, verse 13. This whole section is about the coming of the Lord. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. 
For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Look at chapter 5, verse 2. For you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the light, in the night. Look at chapter 5, verse 4. But you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief. Look at chapter 5, verse 23. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's a short letter, but it mentions it often. Now here's the thing. Because the work of Christ on the cross, Christ crucified, is the single most important thing in the history of the world that God, holy, sinless God, died for us sinners. We cannot expect that the work of Christ on the cross was just that, and now it's over with, because that is not true. As sure as he died on the cross and as sure as he rose again, he has promised I'm coming back, and we are to wait. We are to be ready, and we are to remind ourselves of this often. I want you to add it into your vocabulary and add it into your prayers and add it into your conversations. He's coming back. What if he comes back today? What if he comes back tomorrow? What if he comes back before COVID ends? What if he comes back before you graduate or before you get married or before you have a baby? He could. The Bible tells us he very well may. And we are to believe that, want that, and look for that. Billy Graham once said, Bible teaching about the second coming of Christ was once thought to be doomsday preaching. But not anymore. It is the only ray of hope that shines as an ever-brightening beam in a darkening world. I hope it lifts your head, even now. In a day where we have had many, many reasons to hang our head and be discouraged and ask questions and worry and doubt. May God lift your head with this great truth. We are continually reminded he's coming back for us. He's coming back for us, the return of Christ. Number one, the continual reminder of the return of Christ. But number two, the heavy warning of the return of Christ. Simultaneously, in the message of the return of Christ, is both extraordinary hope and incredible fear. For those that want Jesus to come back, it will be awesome. For those that don't, it will be awful. So point number two is this heavy warning of the return of Christ. For you to see this in its fullness, I want you to turn to 2 Thessalonians. It's where it starts. See, 1 Thessalonians talks about the return of Christ many times. I just showed you all those passages. But to the same people, the church in in Thessalonica... We have this second letter, and I want you to see. Look at chapter 1, verse 5. This is evidence of the righteous judgment of God, that you may be considered worthy 
of the kingdom of God for which you are also suffering. Since indeed God considers it just to repay with affliction those who afflict you and to grant relief to you who are afflicted as well as to us. Now pay attention here. When the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus, they will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. When he comes on that day to be glorified in his saints and to be marveled at among all who have believed because our testimony to you was believed. Heavy passage, right? Very heavy passage. There is a warning in the return of Christ. There is a comfort in the return of Christ. And that's going to be my third point here in just a minute. But there is a strong warning in the return of Christ that if you do not want him to return or you do not think that he will return, that when he does return, it will be terrible for you. It will be awful. He loves us. And he came the first time to die for us, to receive us, to welcome us, to save us, to forgive us, to deal with all of the judgment of God on our behalf. He is the propitiation for our sins. He is our advocate in heaven. He will never, ever, ever leave us or forsake us or let us go. And nothing can come between us and him. To reject that is to bring the judgment of God and suffer the punishment of eternal destruction from God. Thessalonians says, we are to hear that warning. A.W. Pink once said, the first time Christ came to slay sin In men, the second time Christ comes, he will slay men in sin. But that's why it's a warning. And that's why he's waiting. That's why Jesus isn't in a hurry. That's why he's patient with us. He's given us time. He's given you time. To wake up and be ready. Oh, the thought of Jesus coming back when we're in the midst of one of those ugly fights. Oh, the thought of Christ returning when we're relishing in our sin, acting like we can live however we want to. Oh, the thought of Christ returning as we're cussing out our children or in the bed with somebody we should not be in bed with. Or on our phones looking at things that we should not. Imagine if the trumpet goes off and the sky opens while we are totally absorbed in things that are against God and against us. And yet we are in them. The return of Christ is to be a warning. Is that where you want to be when Jesus comes back? And the book to the Thessalonians reminds us this. Paul had traveled there. He had been beaten by Thessalonians, but he gave them the message. He reasoned with them. He convinced them. He loves you. He died for you. He'll forgive you of your sins. Turn to him. And many believed. Many Jews believed. Many Gentiles believed. Many women believed. There was a church of Christians, of believers in Thessalonica. And he writes this letter back to them. He's coming. Be ready. Don't be surprised. Hear the warning. There's a tendency for us to hear that strong message that we just read from 2 Thessalonians 1 and to think that his return is a bad thing. That is not true. That is not true. The bad thing is our sinful waywardness that doesn't want the good thing. We must believe that a loving savior is not a bad thing. A loving judge, a good judge is not a bad thing. What is bad is our disregard and our disobedience against him. Our sinfulness is the bad thing. So that his return will just put that in the right. It doesn't mean his return is bad. We are to hear that warning. 
the continual reminder of the return of Christ, the heavy warning of the return of Christ, and lastly, this morning, in our introduction to Thessalonians, the needed comfort of the return of Christ. We need it. We need to be comforted by the completed work and salvation of our Lord Jesus Christ. That it was God's predestined plan before the foundation of the world to save his people. That he sent his son to the earth to be born of a virgin, to live this life, to die on the cross, to be buried in the grave, to rise from the grave, to show victory over all of it, to ascend up into heaven, and yet to come back and to get us and to set up heaven. For as much as we long for heaven, heaven is not there yet. We wait for that. We look forward to heaven and it is coming. And it is a comfort to us that Christ will return and make it all right. We are to be eagerly waiting. We are to find encouragement in this. 1 Corinthians 1, 7 says, awaiting eagerly for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. Philippians chapter three says, our citizenship is in heaven from which also we eagerly wait for a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Hebrews 9, 28 says that Christ came the first time to deal with sin and the second time that he comes, it will not be to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. Paul writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy 4, 8, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day and not only to me, but also to all who have a loved his appearing. The New Testament says there's a whole crowd of people, a whole group of people, a whole flock of people, a whole church of people, the living church, the redeemed saints of the Lord Jesus Christ who were ransomed on the cross by the blood of Jesus, who are eyes to heaven, knees to the ground, hope and heart toward God that one day he's coming back and all of the heartache will be over and right will be right and wrong will be wrong and the one with the sword will prove it with love. It's coming. And it should comfort us. Billy Graham said the second coming of Christ will be so revolutionary that it will change every aspect of life on this planet. Christ will reign in righteousness. Disease will be arrested. Death will be modified. War will be abolished. Nature will be changed. Man will live as it was originally intended he should live with God in peace. All because of Jesus. May you believe it. May you believe it. And may you be strengthened by the letter to the Thessalonians that we know many people don't believe it. And they mock at that and they scoff at that. Even today, people will walk outside and lift their eyes to heaven and make fun of God and mock him or shake their fist at him or do any type of living that they want to do because they don't believe that the return of Christ is coming. But the Bible says it is and he will. And that is to be our comfort. We are to be comforted by it. Several years ago, we had our vacation Bible school here, and those are wild nights, as y'all know, from 6 to 9 o'clock, people everywhere and kids, and some people come and drop them off or whatever, and one night, VBS had ended. One night, VBS had ended, and it was 9 o'clock, 9.15. By now, it's getting dark in the middle of the summer, and as we're standing around in the parking lot and More and more cars leave, fewer and fewer cars in the parking lot. More and more people leave, fewer and fewer people in the parking lot, and fewer and fewer kids. And We got to the very end at about 10 o'clock, and there was still this real little young girl, a first grader, running around playing at 10 o'clock. And there were just a few adults left, and we looked around like, does anybody know who this is? And we're like, well, we got a registration. This is her name, and who dropped her off? And nobody came to pick her up. Little first grade girl, 10 o'clock at night in the summertime. She didn't know enough to tell us her address even. She didn't know a phone number. We didn't know what we could do. We had no way to get in touch of anybody. So we called the police. By now it's like 10.30, we called the police. and The police somehow was able to figure it out. and Got this girl home and I followed just because I was curious. We got there and the mom was out in the yard on her phone at 10.30 at night. And all she said was, oh, I forgot, forgot I had dropped her off. It got me thinking for a minute what it would be like as a first grader to not have anybody 
come back for you. But then that got me thinking about all the days I've been at ball practice, literally thousands of times in my life, that a practice has ended and we're just waiting on our ride. Fifteen guys sitting there and we're all waiting on our ride, waiting on our ride, waiting on our ride, and the first one comes and you're down to 14, next one comes, you're down to 13, you know, and you get down there to the end and you get down to three or four guys left and you start joking with each other like, man, she forgot you, man, she ain't coming. Your, your parents forgot you, they're not coming for you. And for a split second, you're like, what? What if they really did? What, what if my mom just said, I'm done, I'm done with him. I ain't coming back for him. And you kind of think, man, surely not, right? She's coming to get me. And then the last fourth guy leaves, third guy leaves, second guy. Now it's just you. Coach is in the locker room finishing up his stuff, and it's just you. And you're like, what if they don't come back to get me? And all of a sudden, around the corner, here comes the car. And you're like, what was I thinking? I knew she was coming to get me. That's my mom, man. I knew she's coming to get me. Because my mom is dependable and she loves me. And this book says, he is coming to get you. It may be 2100 and you might think, is he even coming? It may be 3021. I'll be thinking, is he really coming? But I assure you this. He who promised is faithful. He who died for us is faithful. And I'm warning you now. When the cry goes off. And the trumpet sounds. And the sky opens up. You're going to say, that's my ride. And I knew he was coming for me. He saved my soul. He forgave me of my sins. He cleansed my conscience. He gave me hope in this dark world. And I knew he was coming back for me. And I'm ready. Oh, I'm ready. Take me to heaven, Jesus. Take me to heaven. And over the next several weeks and months, we, a church, are going to grow strong together through the letters to the Thessalonians. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for the second coming of Christ. God, we're ready for it. We want it. And your word strengthens us in it. It's a small letter to the Thessalonians, but it's filled with hope of the return of Christ. Father, I pray that we would turn from our sins, hear the warning, and be comforted by it. Father, thank you for our Savior. He who promised is faithful. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We want you to trust in Christ. We want you to respond to the message. We want you to believe. As we sing now our final song, let's do that. If you want to talk about getting right with God, you want to join our church, you need to be baptized, you want to make any response. You want to make the return of Christ your absolute hope, and you want to tell some people about it. Let's do that now. Let's sing in our time of response. Arise, my soul, arise. Shake off your guilty Just blood to please.
Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your spirit, soul, and body be kept sound and blameless for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. Amen. Amen. 